Welcome to the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States, ARCUS, where Arctic research has connected since 1988. My name is Asma Shitwala, and thank you for coming to our 25th Arctic Research Seminar Series presentation here in Washington, D.C., where we are delighted to welcome Jackie, Dr. J Jackie Grummeyer. ARCUS connects Arctic research across boundaries through communication, coordination, co and collaboration, providing the essential intangible infrastructure required for research to advance. We're a nonprofit consortium working together to promote exploration and understanding of the Arctic. Whether you're here online, we invite each of you to become an ARCUS member. All types of organizations are eligible to become ARCUS member, um, such as in including academic institutions, government agencies, corporations, and indigenous organizations. Also, any individual who shares our enthusiasm about the Arctic research can become an ARCUS member. You can fill out an application online or on the website or here on site. This seminar series is designed to provide unique access to a wide range of leading Arctic researchers and federal officials, members of the DC Arctic policy community, and anyone working in the Arctic. The ideas shared here represent the cutting edge of what we are exploring and learning up north, and also what it means for the US and the rest of the world. If you're in the room, you should have received a seminar evaluation, we would, which we would like you to return to the registration desk after the seminar. And online, please fill out the survey, which will appear at the conclusion of today's seminar. On the evaluation, you can suggest to us future seminar series speakers. For those of you on Twitter, we, we encourage you to use the hashtag ArcusWebinar to discuss the event. We're currently joined by more than 135 registered participants in at least 14 US states, and in Brazil, Canada, Finland, France, Greenland, the Netherlands, Norway, Russia, and the United Kingdom. Okay. Okay. Um, for those of you on the webinar, my colleagues are available to answer any questions you have about ARCUS or Arctic research. And to forward to us here in DC, any questions for Dr. Grabmeyer. You'll have the opportunity to submit text questions by typing, your, by typing your questions into the chat pane of your attendee control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we will address them during the Q&A session at the end. I would like to acknowledge our partners in this seminar series, the Consortium for Ocean Leadership, which enables us to use this excellent meeting space and of course, the National Science Foundation Division of Polar Programs for major financial support to ARCUS and this seminar series. Now, let me hand over to our Executive Director, Bob Rich, to introduce our speaker. Thank, thank you, Asma. So, um, introducing uh, Jackie Grebmeyer, she's a research professor at the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory at the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science in Solomons, Maryland. Um, I first got to know Jackie through her longstanding commitment to partnering with teachers through the Arcus Polar Trek program. And I just would point out that if you're interested in Polar Trek, it's a wonderful program, and the deadline is this week. So, uh, if you if you want to sign up, it's not too late. Um, and uh, Jackie's participated in Polar Trek multiple times. Uh, together, um, Jackie and I participate in outreach activities around DC with her bringing samples of some really interesting uh, uh, invertebrates in uh, little jars uh, um, to, uh, for people to explore. The kids love this stuff. Um, Jackie holds a, a Bachelor of Science from the University of California, Davis, a master's degree from Stanford and the University of Washington, and a PhD in biological oceanography from the University of Alaska, Fairbanks. And she's served in many, many leadership roles during her career, including as a member of the U.S. Arctic Research Commission, the Polar Research Board of the National Academies, um, the International Arctic Science Committee. And she's also a major force behind the internationally coordinated distributed biological observatory. I, I really could go on a long time with all of this, but I'm not going to because I'm sure you'd rather hear more about uh, uh, more from Jackie than about all of her many awards and accomplishments. So please join me in welcoming to the Arcus DC Arctic Research Seminar Series Jackie Grebmeyer to tell us about the Pacific Arctic, an ecosystem in transition. Thank you very much, Bob, for the introduction and for uh, everyone in the room and online to come and hear about some of the uh, fascinating aspects and changes that we're seeing in the Pacific Arctic. So the uh, presentation today, I have co-authors that you see listed there, uh, Karen Fry from Clark University, Lee Cooper from UMSIS, as well as Monica Kedra from Poland. 
who've been involved with various aspects of, of our research. And these are some of the cast of characters that you're seeing in the lower part of this first slide. A uh, Pacific walrus, the diving sea duck, threatened spectacled diders on the middle and the lower right are the, are the uh, clams that are dominant for their prey for feeding on these organisms. So the main por uh, por part of the talks that I'd like to speak to you, main points, well, one, I, we all know that there's decreasing sea ice going on in the Pacific Arctic region. We are seeing uh, warming of bottom seawaters, especially in 2018, and I'll show you a figure on that. We also have seen a, a northward movement of some of the prey, prey concentrations that are important for some of these uh, benthic feeding organisms. So as part of the uh, Distributed Biological Observatory that Bob mentioned in the introduction, uh, we have various international groups and national, they're looking at status and trends of these, some of these key parameters, both the environmental, chemical, and biological aspects. And I want to emphasize the importance of looking at time and space uh, on the sampling, both seasonally and interannually. So within this, uh, hello, uh, there, oops, whoops, I just went way beyond, okay. So on the Distributed Biological Observatory, this is a consortium network of uh, observations done both on national and international programs, uh, NOAA, NSF, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, and NASA and others. Um, the importance on the field sampling is we look at measurements of temperature and salinity. Uh, we look at chlorophyll and nutrients, uh, also on the biological aspects of the taxa. So from lower trophics, from the phytoplankton uh, composition to zooplankton, and also the benthic animals, which will be the focus of what I will speak about today. And the importance of these for uh, marine mammals and seabirds. There's put, uh, multiple types that use these organisms. But also it's important to look at the fisheries. And we are seeing changes in the Arctic of northward movement of fisheries. And so some of the studies are looking at acoustics and also doing bottom trawling in the region. Uh, in addition to what you're seeing on the slide here, uh, you can see the various, so going from the northern Bering Sea, this is the, uh, just below Bering Strait, north of Bering Strait, into uh, past uh, uh, Barrow Canyon here and into the Barents Sea. Is there also gliders? Folks are, have different components that are using gliders, moorings. To put it into the context of time over the year, sail drones is something that is being looked at for atmospheric and upper water column as a technology, and also satellite observations. So the important parts of these is that we're looking at hot spots of, of, of biodiversity and change along this uh, uh, northward uh, series of lines. So just to set the stage for you in the Pacific Arctic here, you're seeing here that we have, a, it's an evective regime, which means there's a lot of current flow coming through on the, uh, through the Bering Strait here. On the western side, we have nutrient cold rich, what we call anadir water. On the near shore, near Alaska, we have a warmer uh, nutrient pour by the, uh, after the spring bloom on the Alaska coastal water, and then a mixture in between. And on the right here, what you're seeing is these cold temperatures are in blue, and you'll see this on the charts, the red is higher temperature, and these are some of the bottom waters. So these are very cold below zero, south of the St. Lawrence Island, as well as up as you move up into higher into the northern part of the Chukchi Sea. And you see the warming of this Atlantic water, uh, I mean, excuse me, the Alaska coastal water along the Alaska coastline. So looking at some of the satellite observations, we can look at both monthly and annual variability and chlorophyll content. And I just want to point out a few aspects. This is when the spring blooms. So if you look down here on the uh, horizontal bar four, that's in April and this is May, and you see the big peaks here. This is the spring bloom. As the ice is starting to retreat, we have ice edge blooms and then uh, it becomes open water. And we're seeing an earlier season and I'll show you some graphics on that a little later. If you go up to the DBO2, we start seeing two spe uh, peaks in this in uh, spring and then early summer. And as you move northward, we get into the observing just north of Bering Strait, DBO3, and then DBO4, and then this is up in Vibero Canyon. And I would point out that the talk is going to mainly focus on these three uh, areas because they're around the Bering Strait region and areas where we're seeing the highest level of change as well as where we have the longest time series. So just as a generic uh, look at what the system looks like, the coloring, the darker the color on any of these maps, it's higher biomass. And so these are organisms that are collected off the bottom. These are ones that walruses and gray whales and diving sea ducks feed upon. And then they've been converted to carbon so that we can get rid of their shell content. 
And so you can see the variability, uh, these boxes surround the bounding boxes of these major regions that we've been looking at uh, over time. And I will show you some further information on that. The important thing is they act as footprints. So they uh, are showing you areas in which there's a lot of what we call pelagic benthic coupling, which means the ability for water column production to settle down to the underlying sediments and provide food, organic carbon, carbon for these organisms to feed on. And the main cast of characters are kind of pictured over here in the lower right. And we have clams over in this area. These are amphipods that are fed on by gray whales, particularly. And then some of the polychaete worms, of which the fish will feed upon, as well as actually walruses, too. So this is the, when you look up at the benthic foragers, uh, and they're responding to changes, we're seeing some of their prey, uh, particularly the gray whales. We are seeing a, re a shift in distribution. And this reflects the fact that the sea ice is opening up uh, earlier. They're able to move northward, and they're looking for changes in their uh, and, and patches of food. Uh, they also have found uh, euphosids that they stay, uh, they're primary, they're a good food for bowhead whales, but they're also on the near the sediment bottom that can be fed upon by some of these gray whales. We have walruses, and I think any of you in the news have seen that they've been losing their sea ice platform. They need this for riding. They often ride the ice from south to north across the system, diving down over areas in which they can feed using less uh, caloric content, less body uh, fat if they stay on the ice and if they're in the water. They use it for resting and, cal uh, and calving. And then diving sea ducks here, they're being influenced by changing sea ice location because they also use it for resting platform in the late winter south of St. Lawrence Island, but then they use that to dive down and they also spend more energy if they sit in the water than if they're on the ice. As we go through the talk, there are a couple of videos that are for each one of these areas so you can see the, what the benthic system looks like. Um, these are available and you can get this when you take the, uh, when you look at this after the fact, but they're on uh, YouTube and you can go and look at these different, at all the different DBO sites and look at the organisms. This is just an example here. These are some of the tuna cakes uh, up in the region. And then you can see uh, these are uh, here, some of the collections that we've made at the various sites on our annual uh, Sir Wilfrid Laurier cruise. So the three areas that I'd like to focus in on uh, where we're seeing uh, for the longest time series are the DBO-1, which are, this is St. Lawrence Island here. Uh, and then we go up to DBO-2. This is what's called the Chirikoff Basin. Station names are related to a historic names that we've had for those sites. And then up in the DBO3 area, where we're looking at this from the south to the north on these stations in this region here. And uh, these are just depth in the background. So if we look at the first area here, this is south of St. Lawrence Island. And this is the region which these diving sea ducks, the world population, they overwinter, they overwinter in this pollinia from Russia and from the US. They are there uh, feeding, they're breeding, they're molting, they're dancing, they're having their mating courtships. And then they end up going to uh, land to have, their, uh, to have their nests and proceed on with the life cycle. They mainly feed on these three types of clams. It's a very shallow system. We're talking between 40 and 80 meters. And they, uh, it has very high potential for carbon produced in the water column to settle down to the underlying sediments. I would just point out here, this is a coal pool that forms traditionally up to this point, up to 2018, south of St. Lawrence Island, keeps the temperatures below zero, also maintains, uh, keeps a lot of the, our commercial fisheries uh, to the south of the, uh, of the region, except for this year, you'll see. And that uh, it also, ex it excludes both fish and many of the epibenthic predators. But we're also seeing the potential for acidification, and that is another talk, but these are something that all the animals that have calcium carbonate, they're susceptible to, and acidification being when, when you have more carbon dioxide in the water and you have more, it becomes more acidic, has the capability to dissolve calcium carbonate and aragonate, the things that many of these animals build as shells or internal parts. So the first slide that I'm going to show you, and they'll be done for each one of the three regions. This is the sea ice trends. Uh, this is you're looking at freeze up, which is the, the top graph, the annual persistence, and then break up. Freeze up means in the fall. This increasing here means it's later in the fall. The annual persistence means over a year. How long does it actually stay over that site? And you can see it's been a uh, variable, but then declining, particularly outside this gray box here. And this is in the last couple of years. And then the break, uh, this is the breakup time. 
And I would point these out because they're significantly out, significant outliers. There's so something that we're seeing outside the gray box of the norm. And I put the gray box on there because that's where we're focusing on the time series for the rest of the talk. But this has to be emphasized of the tipping point potential and the change in this system. So just to set the stage of what the hydrography looks like, we're looking at here salinity, uh, looking at the temperature. I would highlight the bottom water temperatures. This is now south of St. Lawrence Hot Island here in the DB01. On traditionally up to this year, we're below zero almost year round. And then what you're seeing here, I would point out is the, uh, this is the chlorophyll. So by the time we're there on these annual July cruises, the spring production and the early uh, summer has already settled down to the chlorophyll max. And you can see that riding at about 30, 30 40 meters down here. Uh, I also emphasize there's a box you'll see, and this is the, like the maximum amount of chlorophyll. And this will become a magnitude higher the further north of Bering State that we go. And then we're looking at uh, also measure the nutrients that are important. The richer nutrients are all in the bottom water because the surface water has had the extraction to build that chlorophyll base. If you look at the satellite-based chlorophyll, as I've mentioned, most of the bloom is happening in the uh, April and May period. We've had it where it's come earlier in 2016, uh, came later a little bit in 2017, but really most of it is happening in the spring. This is the south of St. Lawrence Island and not much going on after that. And that's because you get a strong stratification and uh, the upper water column is not having re renewed, regenerated with nutrients. It's the bottom area that maintains that. And so we don't have much of production in the fall. If you look at the animals that live on the bottom, this is on one of the time series sites we have. And this is in the northern part of the St. Lawrence Island Polynia. What you're seeing here is the near the bottom, soft sediments, brittle star. This is a hermit crab in a, in a, in a snail shell here. And you're looking at a, this is a, a, also a predatory uh, worm here. But these little tiny holes here are all the siphon holes for the clams that live in these soft sediments. And you see, this is a sea anemone on the bottom here. So on these slides, we actually are able to slow these down and start doing counts of the animals that live on the surface of the sediment. So if you look at the time series of the biomass, and this is total station biomass, we are having significant trends. This is done with the non-parametric man Kindle uh, tau. Basically, you see the variability, but these three time series sites are statistically significant. They've been declining since around 2000. Um, and it's these top two actually that are in the northern part of the system that aren't significantly changing yet. And so the southern ones, and you say, well, why, why are they changing? Uh, one of the things is that we, uh, just to be explicit about it, we see this northern uh, increase in biomass. Part of that reason has to do with the changing speed of the currents, which is in, we see this through the indication of settling uh, a finding of out of the sediments. And so these stations that are in the south here, they're becoming muddier. And the animals that are dominating now are, are, are worms, which are not the prey of these diving sea ducks. Um, but this is a, a key component of one of it. So there's a contraction northward of this high biomass prey for these animals. Um, they are dominated by uh, bivalves. They all were dominated by clams, of which these diving sea ducks would feed on, as well as walruses. And then you're looking from 2000 to 2015. These three southern ones have, have moved from being dominated by these clams to by these worms uh, that in concentration can provide food for walruses if, they, if the ice was there. But most of the sea ducks are not, dive, are not getting enough energy from, they're not divers, ducks like to eat clams. And so you'll see this here and there's a lot of buildup up in this northern region. If you look at the uh, temperature, and this I'm putting out, this is just the field temperature from bottom water. Uh, Phyllis Stabenow at PMEL NOAA, Pacific Marine Environment Lab, has a mooring in this area. And I'm sure the data sets that are coming out from 2008 are showing this really high outlier. And this is the bottom water temperature. Very little ice was formed. It was formed late. The polynia did not function as it normally would. So there was a lot of up warmer water pulsing through the system. And at the same time, I would point out that NOAA put out an emergency trawling cruise in order to find out where the cod and pollock were in some of the areas, and they found them up by Bering Strait. These have been projected by multiple 
uh, scientists that if that cold pool that is in the middle part of the Bering Sea or the southern part of St. Lawrence, particularly driven by the, in our air by this plania, was to not to function, then that would provide an opportunity of warmer water and, and an ability for, for fish to move northward. So this is something we're going to be tracking quite a bit because these, not even the error bars, are overlying what we've normally seen in this region. The salinity is, is, is basically within the norm, although there's a little bit of indication of freshening. If you look at the sea ice trends, you see a similar type of thing. Uh, the freeze up is later, uh, slowly going up, and this is now in the DBO2, so this is north of St. Lawrence Island. The persistence is declining with real outliers in this 2015 onwards uh, time period. So this is, uh, these are ones that are basically the cold water has been replaced. We've been having warmer bottom water, even north of St. Lawrence Island, and the potential for that to have an impact on biological processes in the water column. And so uh, again, all the gray boxes that you see on any of these figures are outlining where I'll show you the time series data. Hydrography, uh, once again, now you're looking at bottom water temperatures of two to four. So we're up in this area here in the DBO uh, two region. Uh, this is salinity here. Uh, uh, this is uh, temperature against salinity. Main thing to see is you got this warm water way, way up on the surface. And this is up by 10 degrees. This is really warm water for this area, but we're, we're even the bottom water is up to two to four are warm. Point out again that the uh, it is a higher number here for chlorophyll. Most of it is down now at the mid depth and even settling down to the bottom. And then again, these are nutrients, most of them hanging in the bottom waters. So what does that do for production? Again, we have most of the spring production going on in the, now a little bit later May and June period as the ice retreats. But you'll see a little bit higher here, we're starting to begin to get fall blooms. That means that's more like a temperate signature. Uh, normally uh, that you have these blooms that allow then another pulse of organic carbon. But by then the zooplankton have really warmed, have, with the warmer temperatures have started building their populations up and they're able to graze down that chlorophyll. If you look at who's, who's the cast of characters on the bottom, and remember these are videos of what we're seeing on the surface. So I'm pointing out some things in the macrofauna. So here are the, uh, some of the uh, rocks with bryozoans on them. You're looking at some of the sea anemones. This is actually a string bryozoan. And what that's telling you is the currents pick up along here. These are thousands and thousands of small crustaceans inside a gelatinous uh, tube that looks like a kelp. We have sea anemones and you see this fresh chlorophyll actually carbon that settled down from the benthos. This is your closest relative, it's a tunicate. Uh, has a notochord and a nerve cord when you when they're young. They don't look like you now. Um, but anyway, so it's quite the, but these little dots here are where the amphipods would be. And this is one of these stations that has a lot of these uh, food for gray whales uh, in this system. But the same type of thing, uh, we have more variability here. Uh, we have actually, just to let you know, increased the number of stations from four to seven in order to, to try to tighten up our analysis. But these are the time series sites. Now from 1999 to 2015 here, one station has the most significant trend and that's in the Northwest. But main thing is that the two Western states time series sites have now moved to bivalves and polychaetes, which are not gray whale foods. And the two Eastern ones have moved into being these amphipod dominated areas, which are small shrimp like creatures. This is better shown here. These are the animals I'm speaking about. Ampelisca macrocephala is a dominant, uh, uh, animal, uh, it's a small crustacean, there's maybe five to 10,000 per meter squared on rich sites, and they live in tubes like straws that stabilize the sediment. And what you're seeing here through these decades is this contraction of the spatial area. And what you're seeing on the next figure will be, the, uh, the previous one and the next one, is this contraction is northward. What they're being replaced by are particularly in the southwest one are by these uh, amphipod, amp amphoretid polychaetes, which are food for sculpins. So if there's winners, the fisheries, local fisheries, not, we don't normally go after the sculpins on a commercial level, but for the local communities that live on these islands, the, uh, the, the sculpins are, are something that are, uh, can be used as a prey base. So just by color coding on these, uh, the uh, pinks are the amphipods that I'm talking about, the browns are the bivalves, and the yellow are the polychaetes, so the marine worms. And what you're seeing, all four of these are the time series. These two are in the north. These two are the, uh, and this is the northeast and southeast. On this particular time series uh, area, they have, it's an east-west gradient. 
And that's because there's a front actually between the two easternmost stations, which are dominated by these amphipods, and the two western ones. I just want to point out that when we started this time series back in the late, in the early 1990s, these were amphipods, all four of these. But then when we started doing, uh, when we got there in July, because I'm only showing you, showing you July periods, they already had changed to uh, bivalves, and this is related to a finding actually of those sediments. And they're being taken over by these uh, marine worms that are not a big prey for these uh, gray whales. So we're basically our contraction northward and eastward of that hotspot area. If you look at the next, uh, as we move into the uh, uh, north of Bering Strait, this is our persistent hotspot that has the highest benthic biomass uh, that we have in this, in this region. Uh, I would point out the temperatures are now about four degrees Celsius on the bottom water. And you see here, this, at this particular time when we're out in July, because all of these are just July data that I'm showing you to standardize the measurements, this is chlorophyll. It's at the subsurface chlorophyll map. But what you can't see probably, that's 50, and all the others were around two to five. So this is a magnitude greater. This is, this is maintained by a very large production of spring and summer chlorophyll in that water column. And most of the nutrients are actually held on the western side once uh, this has all been depleted because of that production. If you look at the uh, satellite observations, now you're, what you're seeing, you're seeing the spring bloom, which is happening in the, uh, the May period. But if you, if you compare it to the other ones, there's a higher and maintained level actually throughout the summer and another peak in the fall. And this is because when the water goes through Bering Strait, it mixes up and then it brings those bottom water nutrients up to the surface. So we get blooms going throughout the summertime. So even though what I showed you on that July showed it at the chlorophyll max, you could go back there at another time and it could be up in the surface water. So it's this additive amount of organic carbon that's available to this system that maintains this really rich benthic environment. If you look at the sea ice trends here, these are now, uh, uh, these are the outliers and they have occurred uh, earlier, but they're in the uh, different direction. These were back when we had more sea ice here. And then these are significantly significant trends. The other ones that I showed you were trends that we're seeing with outliers. Here, these are run through on a, on a, a non-parametric trend, and they're showing that the persistence of ice has declined significantly. The freeze-up is much later, and the breakup is much uh, earlier in the spring. All of this has an impact of when primary production will occur in the system, and when then is it going to be at a time that certain organisms that are carried with the water, such as zooplankton, they're at the mercy of the currents, that can, unlike fish that can go against the currents, that they are able, they're going to have to adapt or move northward to, uh, uh, to be there at the time in which the production is there. If you look at the time series data, we have extremely significant increase to the north of our uh, clam population. So this is up, this time series is here. These are actually the southern ones are in red, and up here are the uh, northern time series sites. The important point is that they're significantly different, uh, particularly at these two sites, and the overall mean. And the reason the overall mean for the whole uh, time series we have is driven by this station here. So UTN5, uh, this is in the northern part. But as I will show you, we are now, because there's more more production going on and the timing, we're having some extension of these high biomass areas to the south also. Also, So here's the, the final video here, and this is now looking at what we see on the bottom at that site. You'll notice it's a lot cloudier because there's a lot of the currents going past here. This is all what we call marine snow and particulate carbon that's going past the system. You can see sea anemones here, some of the remnants of the clams. Uh, uh, these are big uh, sea stars here. But all the holes that you're seeing are all the holes that these clams send up their siphons because they feed in the upper uh, water column at the interface. So this uh, pointed out by this histogram, these are coming from now to 1998. Uh, when we started that time series here to 2015, you can see the clams have really grown from two, three, four, and five but actually most of the five was the most significant. So we've got a lot more prey base for walruses, for bearded seals. Uh, the ducks don't occupy, these are a different species of, of clam and they're bigger, they're nutrient rich, they live 30, 40 years long. They're important for the walrus. 
But what you will see is that in the last uh, period since about 2000, this increase in biomass, particularly in the last three to four years. And this is related to the, uh, uh, the core of the enhancement with the sea ice pulling back. It has more time and open space for primary production to occur. More carbon can happen. A lot of it can settle down to the sediments. And as a result, the animals in the sediments are actually uh, responding to that increased carbon load. And this is something that uh, uh, colleagues that are doing the satellite work have indicated for various parts of the, uh, of the Arctic as the sea ice moves back to a significant level. So statistically, and this is the combination now between the south, this is the uh, DBO1, DBO2, and DBO3, and just visualizing the significant trends that we're seeing in these biomass. These are the declines that we're seeing in the southern part of the St. Lawrence Island with significant uh, uh, overall mean for that. As you march up into north of the, the St. Lawrence Island, uh, only one station, as I mentioned, but they're all in the more negative here, except for this one up here, which are those polychaetes. And then moving in north of Bering Strait, where you get this huge significant increase of where you have this dominant uh, clam population. But on the and but the overall mean, as I said, is driven by that really that one station and a couple of the other ones. Uh, this one here is a southernmost station. I would just point it out. We keep it. There's no clams there. They're they're sand dollars. And you say, well, why are you bother doing it? Because when we set up the time series, they were clams at the start of that time series back in the 70s and early 80s. But by the time we were doing the annual cruises, which is what these are presenting, and they are a big hit on the cruise because sand dollars are just everybody wants them to, to, uh, to take home. So we, we satisfied that need. But, uh, but it also shows an interesting component that uh, the fact that even different animals are showing this uh, significant increase. So how do we move on from here? We have data sets that are collected not only on our, the annual July cruises we have, uh, uh, that we have under, under NSF support but on, and NOAA support. In the past, we have uh, cruises and later on in the season, uh, NOAA that supports. We have uh, different uh, agencies. For example, NOAA Fisheries are having and uh, the North Pacific Research Board. So there's a lot of interagency components supporting the, the observing system and bringing those data together and putting them into, this is the start of our conceptual models. This is an EVECTA model we put together under the North Pacific Research Board support for looking at lots of data sets by lots of people. And there we had about 12 PIs on that. Uh, this is the traditional that if you have more ice algae, more of the Carbon goes to the bottom for diving sea ducks and walrus. And the idea about if we start having more open water blooms and less sea ice, most of it will start being grazed by the uh, organism there in the water column, such as the copepods. So there are going to be winners and losers as the sea ice uh, uh, retreats and the timing of that retreat. We're also working uh, with modelers in, uh, at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, looking at where the uh, the timing and the source of this phytodetritus, you know, you have in situ, which means it's produced right in that one area, or is it being evicted from the south? And we, it is being evicted, but how do you model that? How do you put that into something then you relate it to what we're seeing in the water column, as well as what we're seeing in the in the benthos? And so this is uh, combining a bio, a physical sea ice physical and a, a benthic model, uh, and this is uh, being done by. Uh, uh, Dr. Fang and uh, as a as a lead with uh, other PIs uh, that we're involved with. The other uh, the one of the core uh, a conceptual model that we're using to bring this all together is this uh, Arctic Marine Pulses model, and it's a, it was for the Pacific Arctic domain. And this is basically this is the area where I've been discussing today, where we have high pelagic benthic coupling. As you move north and into the coastal zones, the river domain, particularly near shore zones, or move into the Beaufort Sea and head eastward, you get that uh, input in there. And then we have this, uh, this advection and upwelling occurring in the Beaufort Shelf. So these are different advective processes that are feeding into uh, how the system is working. And so our plan is we're taking DBO data to feed into different parts of this. I would mention that I, I focused in on three sites for our longest time series, but we also have uh, three DBO sites in the Beaufort Sea, particularly being occupied by our Canadian and, and American colleagues working up in the uh, Beaufort Sea. We have a developing uh, observing DBO observing system in the Atlantic sector, and then one uh, in the uh, 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 working with potentially in the lap to see in the as well as one uh, developing potentially in the in the uh, 
Baffin Bay area with Canadian colleagues. So the idea is that you would then build a pan Arctic connection and all this requires sharing data. It require, and we do have data meetings as far as the, the DBO activities uh, w that we do within, our, uh, uh, within this international program. We have the Pacific Arctic Group that uh, is a, an international group particularly focused on the Pacific. We have a DBO uh, uh, workshop. We have data meetings where people gather. Uh, we've had, uh, we had our fourth one last fall. And then we have international meetings. And the idea to bring those where the data sets are, to bring them in as a unified area and feed them in at this stage into some modeling activities. So I think at this point, I'd like to just do a, a brief summary on findings and then uh, move into uh, questions on this. Uh, we are seeing this change in the, particularly uh, the biological sampling across, and there's a need for space and time sampling to look at ecological shifts. And you might have asked, why do you bother with the, the benthic system? They're long-term integrators. So whereas the water column, and they provide valuable information in particularly seasonal, that the, and they move the water masses, these animals that live in the bottom average and they take in uh, a composite amount of information, information and they live 30 to 50 years. So they're actually in course, so when they start changing in their population, they're taking that, they're, there's some major changes going on in the, in the upper water column uh, aspect. Uh, there is this need for repeat sampling and uh, collecting not only biological, but we need environmental data and also embedded in the physical oceanography and the sea ice. Every one of the DBO lines or stations I mentioned are time series up to one to five have moorings by different agencies uh, that uh, NSF, NOAA, uh, North Pacific Research, Alaska Ocean Observing System. So it's important that we have this integrated activities because no one, I don't think one agency or one PI can, can get the composite of what we need to understand ecosystem change. Um, there also, I would point out there are process studies going on. So there are funded programs that come in and out in three to five years. They've embedded, for example, the Alaska Marine, uh, Alaska Marine Biodiversity Observing Network funded by the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, NOAA and NSF. They had embedded DBO three and four, I didn't talk about four, into how do you build a, a biodiversity observing network. So it allows us when these process cruises go out to increase our coverage and end numbers uh, when they, for this observing. So it's allowed us to have this observing system uh, going in place since 1998. Uh, but previous to that were, were samplings that were undertaken under all the different types of uh, programs. But this comes in and out, the importance of having the coordination, and we have that part of the Marine Ecosystem Collaborative Team for interagency work up in the, uh, up in the Arctic for this particular program. Uh, there's a strong need for time series analysis. Uh, we have it for uh, satellites, importance of uh, time series under moorings, but it's also important for biology and chemistry. And a lot of these moorings have sensors on them and they're doing fluorescence and they're also looking at sediment trap, how the carbon gets down. And they each, we have two, I think two or three of these um, have a time series of sediment traps on them. But the important point is every one of the uh, uh, DBO one to five have more in place there. So we can put what we see on the seasonal cruises going from May to October in the context of annual measurements. Uh, we are seeing these time series data uh, indicating particularly in the three that I mentioned today, uh, this northward shift. So it's, is it a range extension or range contraction? Um, we are seeing the shift in biomass and we are she seeing a shift in the dominant type of animals. These are persistent areas. So the, the physics and the biology and the chemistry of the, of the system produces enough carbon that settles out in these, these domains. But we are with, when you look inside each one of those domains is where we're seeing the value of these time series sites to look at that, uh, what are the potential drivers and impacts of, and there are a multitude, there's no one that's influencing it all. Um, the importance of tracking uh, the uh, macrofauna prey base so that's associated with the uh, feeding and movement of upper trophic animals. And these are, you know, these are the, the walrus, the gray whales. Uh, we have the bowhead whales feeding off of the, both the fossils that we're seeing in the bottom in our video cameras, as well as a lot in the copepods. We have uh, fish that are moving, appear to be moving northward. They definitely are on the Barents Sea, on their, uh, on their commercial trawling area. They know that, and, and as of this year, we've seen indications of some of that activity in the Pacific side too. So with that, I would just wanted to thank, uh, thank you all and take any questions. Um, I have a lot of collaborators that can't be listed all in here. Many of them are with the Pacific Arctic Group, but our field programs over the years 
for uh, uh, technicians for all the, the PIs that I mentioned on the uh, original slide, multiple agency support. And then uh, there are a couple of web portals there, both the website for DBO as well as the uh, Pacific Arctic Group, and then the different funding base on the bottom. So with that, if you have, I'm happy to take questions via the room, and I turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jackie, for a really interesting and detailed presentation. Um, so for questions, we can take questions in the room. If you want, just raise your hand. And when you do, please press the uh, button um, on your microphone so that we can be heard on the uh, webinar. And go ahead. Um, so Mike McCracken from the Climate Institute. So what do you project will happen if the CO2 concentration goes to 550 or 600 with respect to ocean acidification? That's a good question. I do know we have, I have my PhD student here, Christina Gaither, who's been doing impacts of acidified water on clams. And some species are able to adapt and others they dissolve, uh, they start influencing the quality of their shells. So what would be the impact? If we get a doubling, we have, I didn't put the model in there, but it's gonna have a major impact uh, on organisms that build calcium carbonate and aragonite. I mean, they're already seeing, we see this south of St. DBO1, and we see it up in the Northeast Chuck GC and the three in that sense that you are getting below omega-1, which is the indicator of acidification, and you're seeing this happen seasonally at a level that we know can, imp can impact some of the organisms on the, set, on, on, the, on the benthos. I have seen the study, some studies on the water column. It can impact particularly juvenile levels of uh, water column, you know, zooplankton and, and fish populations. So I've got a question from online here from uh, Will Ambrose, and uh, his question says, your pelagic-dominated future shows a uh, lower amount of biomass in, in the uh, benthic. Um, how do you reconcile that with your observation of a higher biomass of bivalves, which you attributed to a greater flux of carbon to the bottom in response to a reduction of sea ice? And, how, and, and do you have growth rates of the bivalves to show a change uh, with a change in sea ice extent? I will. No, I, we don't have, I don't have the growth rates on them, but they are an, another activity of a graduate student that is looking at that with a length, weight, and uh, biomass over time. Uh, how do you, it's a temporal thing, and this is the phenology of the activity. I mean, if you have a lot of carbon being produced and there are no grazers earlier in the season, a lot of that carbon can get down to the bottom. And so uh, why is it happening uh, in, the, in, the, in the northern Bering Sea and also in the Cherokoff is that I, what happens right now is nearly 50 to 70% of the carbon that's produced in the upper water column cannot be grazed by the zooplankton. So even if you increase the population of the zooplankton, if you don't change, if, and if you increase the population of the phytoplankton, you're still gonna have a lot of organic margin going down at the bottom. So I would say you're pulling back that sea ice, for example, north of, Saint, of uh, Bering Strait, you're having this increase of bivalves actually south, middle and south, you have a lot of primary production going on, and a lot of those uh, zooplankton mouse that could graze that down are being invected out of that system still at a, at a rate. The currents are going faster through Bering Strait. And so I think there's a, it's the timing of events and also the extreme quantity that in some of these areas of the production at the time of year that we've done our sampling that have a, would play in this. So I think you, there's a every system Every one of those areas is not going to act the same way, but in fact, that I think that you are going to have, if you increase your zoo, let's say you doubled your zooplankton, I still think you're going to have a lot of carbon going down to the bottom, and I think that's what's happened now without even doubling zooplankton. So um, I uh, have a question from David Newman. It says, do you think a strengthening of winds, um, which has been observed in certain areas, and a reduction of sea ice could increase available nutrients from the ocean mixing in the fall season for the phytoplankton bloom? Yeah, I think the answer would be yes. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why we're starting to see fall blooms. The, the Pacific, the Bering Strait area is really under the influence of, of advection and winds, and it's all the way up through the Chukchi. And so I think why, the reason why we're starting to see more fall blooms is because you've got more open water, you're turning that, you're able to turn that water up, and you have a, you have, first two things, you have a lot of capability to bring bottom water up to the surface because of that. But the second thing is we're having increased invection, which was bringing more nutrients into certain parts of that uh, north of Bering Strait system. So I think, yeah, winds are a critical component and, and probably play significantly in the why we're seeing these fall blooms. 
So I wonder uh, what would you advise to the uh, coastal communities of the Bering Strait region who are dependent upon uh, um, the uh, subsistence activities in the uh, waters around uh, where, where you're studying um, in terms of what do you think that they're going to have to contend with in the coming decades? Well, I think they're contending, with, having to contend with some of that now. I mean, when the St. Lawrence Island Plinia didn't form and they moved, the ice moved out a month earlier than anything, any time in the past, is that they use that as a platform to do subsistence hunting. And so anybody on the coastal, you know, so in which case they have to go further in their in their craft and their boats to go and get the animals that'll still be migrating north, but oftentimes they're going to be offshore. So it will have it has an impact, and I think they're seeing that. Now, uh, for the near shore, work, uh, you know, the idea that there's, there, has to, there will be some type of an adaption. I mean, bowheads are healthy. I mean, they're endangered, but they're, they're populations. They're feeding off a lot of, of the pelagic organism. They're still following a traditional uh, direction for their migration. So I think that the continuation of their, their subsistence hunt for, for those organisms, as well as, you know, the walruses are coming ashore now because they can't spend a lot of time out on their platforms. So I think the, the, the information that we're getting for the Walrus Outlook, you know, sea ice outlook, other information for the observing for the local communities need to feed into our observing systems. And I think that within the DVO, we've been having discussions with how to, how to do that, exactly how to bring those local community interests and collections from the, you know, up within the villages into the near shore zone. We don't, None of these data are, are deep, shallower than 20 meters. Yet that warm coastal water, it's what's coming into that system. The new long-term ecological research site in the Beaufort will be able to look, they're looking at lagoons at that near shore system, but it always has been the least studied area. So if we can build a, a, a consortium of working with the local communities, I think that would be extremely valuable. And we've, been, we've talked about that, but how to make that happen would be an important thing. Great. So I have a question from Amy Holman at NOAA. It says, uh, what efforts are going on to bring results such as yours together with those from others to inform the residents and decision makers about these changes and their implications? Well, right now we're in the process. What we tried to do is to bring, you know, we have our commitments to write our science papers and all that. And then we have a whole a dedicated issue in that level for bringing the coordinated science in multiple national and international results into that and into the uh, uh, you know, into the National Archives for various organizations. But as far as bringing it to the community, I just gave, I mean, we go out and give talks in a way that is more digestible, I guess, of what's pertinent to their activities. So when I gave a talk in Nome, uh, just before the uh, Healy Cruise, the NOAA-funded uh, observing cruise, uh, we uh, gave a presentation, and it was focused mainly on this south and north of St. Lawrence Island area because it was Nome. And so when we go out and talk to these different groups, it's important for them to see uh, what what activities are going on. And then the question did come up there is that the fishermen are seeing these major changes. So how do we get that connection? And the only way we're going to get that is to figure out the, the verbiage to talk with them and to get it into our, in a lang and not only a language, but an opportunity of how do, do we, we set up a, you know, a four every year or every, you know, that we go up and instead of just when we go on our cruises or maybe in the winter time when they're not hunting, something that would could be standard for them to say, okay, we're going to get updates by these scientists that are all working in this area. And, and, and we are going to feed back to them what we're seeing on the local community level. I think if we could build something like that, it would, it, it, into this program or any of the observing programs would be extremely valuable. Great. Um, from, uh, let's see, uh, Julia S. Uh, says, uh, how much have uh, bottom water temperatures uh, changed in each DBO area since you've been collecting data? And is the warmer coastal surface water penetrating to the bottom waters? Now, I don't think it's the warmer. From what I heard from a recent discussion by Phyllis Stabena, who has a mooring south in the DBO1, this is a pulse of warm Bering Sea water. That has come northward. So the uh, and then the winds were such that their ice didn't form. The plinia to form that plinia that makes this cold brine water. When a plinia forms, wind comes from the north in the winter, it, it freezes the surface. The water gets very cold. The salt is rejected and the ice is formed. But if that process doesn't go on for a long period of time, then you don't make this cold bottom water. And it's, a, it's so it's not coming from the coastal water for those offshore sites. Near shore polinias, and they they occur off of, uh, off of Nome and all the way up the Chuck TC. Those would have would be impact because the warmer water we know is go a lot of the warm water is going in the coastal system. But what we're seeing here, if you march, normally it's minus one point six south of St. Lawrence. It was one point seven this year. 
Will it be that way next year? We have to see, but it's, it's an outlier that's significant. It was a degree or two warmer in DBO2, and, and then it starts to mix, all mix up as you go north. But even that has an the water, the ice pulled back so much earlier this year that watching what happens for ice freeze up, which happens, but what the designated date at the end of September will be a critical. Will it occur in September or is it going to be more like October? Because, uh, you know, this is something that will give us an indication of where we're going to be at in order to how much ice we need to build in order to get what quote would might be normal or we're in a new silt tipping area. Actually, I have, I have two quick questions. So, so one is what's happening with respect to methane in the bottom and, and, and emissions of methane. And the other is with the sea ice back, there's a lot more coastal erosion. And so is that bringing nutrients or other things into the waters that are making a difference? Well, I think in the area we've had, we had sampling of methane. There's not, there's not significant amount of methane in those offshore waters in our system, in the Northern Bering and the Chukchi. When you go over to the East Siberian Sea and you go near shore, even in parts of the, in the Beaufort Sea, where you can get that coastal erosion and you have these deposits that are frozen in sediments, particularly over in the East Siberian Laptev Sea, there's where they're seeing a lot of methane. They see it on land too, and you can light a match and you can see it in a lake. Um, so that is the potential for a major change in those systems. Uh, for the, let's see, the second question was? Erosion. Well, erosion, this is an issue because the, the system is erosion and it ties into, Bob, your question about the coastal communities. They're having to deal with it. We, you know, when we go to the communities, you're seeing more and more of the sandbags to keep the ocean away from eroding the edge. When that carbon, which is old carbon, goes in the near shore zone, it has to be broken down to be able to come back into the food web. And so that's one of the things that uh, Ken Dutton's group for this new ecological LTER site is looking at that aspect. Because right now, when you get that fresh uh, permafrost and organic, old organic carbon, it's not usable by a lot of organisms until it gets broken down by microbially. But I think that near shore coastal zone, which is the least studied area we have, that's the big impact in, in this system. Erosion, and the, but the methane is further where we have those big wide shelves on the Russian side. So um, I, I wonder if you could say a little bit about uh, the way you go about collecting these uh, um, samples of, uh, of the uh, benthic uh, organisms. Uh, um, is, is it like a giant scoop that you're putting down to the bottom? I mean, <laughs> what, what, what are you doing I there? guess I didn't show any of the – I'm sorry. Uh, we have a – it is a scoop. You know, when we do good quantitative measurements, it's called a van being grabbed. You can't see my hands on this, but it just think of a half a pipe, cut it in half, put a lid on it, and make it open and close, and that's a van being grab. Only we have it quantitative. It goes down and it collects a certain surface area, and then we take full replicates on, 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 our, on our program, and then we identify them and bring them home to the lab. We preserve them, bring them home to the laboratory, and that's what is happening now in our in our sorting lab. That's the van being grab. If you're looking at a, a, a experimental work, we have a coring system that brings up nice. Un, un, intact cores with overlying water. So if we want to look at uh, carbon turnover, we want to look at respiration rates, that then we run those shipboard uh, for running experiments. Um, for the water column, we have what's called a conductivity temperature depth, which is a CTD. It's an instrument surrounded by lots of bottles that open and close electronically, and we send that down in the water, click it at different depths, and then it gets the water depths, and then we do all these analyses on that. And the zooplankton nets, they, they, those guys, they use lots of different types of water column nets. And then to do the epibenthos, the camera that I showed, to get any quantitative, qualitative quantitative, you do trawls. And so Katrina Eichen, for example, has the lead of this AMBON program I mentioned. They do trawling all in that area from northern, uh, from Bering Strait north for this part of that biodiversity, bring up these nets, they count them, they weigh them, and then they figure out what the, what the community looks like. So we, we don't work in a vat. We work with a lot of different scientists when we're out at sea, and it's, it's essential because otherwise you're just going to get a narrow vision of what you're doing. Thank you. Other questions? All right. Any other questions online here? All right. Well, let's uh, thank Jackie once again. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, thank you all for coming today. I wanted to make a few quick announcements to wrap up. Uh, the uh, next uh, seminar series presentation will take place on October 30th in this room. Uh, featuring uh, Karin Buman from the uh, Copenhagen Business School, who uh, looks at uh, sustainable resources and uh, Arctic social responsibility. So it should be really interesting 
to hear what she has to say. Um, we uh, are going to be opening up in the next couple of weeks the uh, uh, sign up for the Arctic Community Meeting Rooms at the American Geophysical Union here in Washington, D.C., the first week of December. Um, if you want to have any kind of a meeting around Arctic related topics, uh, uh, Arcus provides these uh, rooms uh, free of charge to the community, so you can sign up with us and uh, be able to have uh, private team meetings, public meetings, workshops, whatever you want to do in that space. Um, we are going to be posting the uh, recording of this uh, seminar and the slides um, within about a week after the uh, conclusion of the seminar. Uh, all of you who are here um, or online will get a copy of the uh, um or we'll get a, a link to the uh, recording so you can uh, go view that at your leisure, um, as well as all of the other previous uh, seminars that we've hosted here. And um, again, invite you to become an Arcus member. We really could appreciate your support. And finally, um, I'd ask that everybody uh, who is in the room here should have gotten a uh, evaluation form. Please fill that out and return that to the registration table. We really do look at these and use them to inform the uh, future seminars that we provide. And if you're online, you can uh, click on that link and we'll be able to uh, fill out the evaluation that way. Um, and with that, uh, I want to thank you all again for participating today. Thanks, Jackie, for a great seminar and hope everybody has a great weekend. Great. Great.